Let's pray together. <clears throat> God, thank you for today. Thank you for this day, for this day of, of sunshine and warmth and fog and all the different things that we've experienced <clears throat> as we gather in, in our homes uh, to participate here. We're, we're mindful of people whose homes have been damaged or destroyed. And we ask for your protection and for your blessing on them as they recover. Uh, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat> so, as we do, a little bit of review as we get started, uh, especially for those of you who might not have been here last week. Um, why study Romans? Um, the The simple answer is <clears throat> no, no single book of the Bible has had as strong an impact on the development of of Christianity as an as a church as a movement <clears throat> probably than Romans apart from the the stories of Jesus in the gospels <clears throat> but even the gospels tend to be read uh piecemeal uh the the book of Romans has had uh just such an <clears throat> outsized uh impact on uh on the development of the church uh, the greatest theologians, uh, some of the greatest theologians in our church history, uh, have looked to Romans uh, uh, as a as a as a touchstone and as a <clears throat> um, as a part of the foundation of their faith. Saint Augustine, who many of you might know by name, but but we don't we don't really read Augustine very much. Uh, anymore, but uh, fourth century from North Africa, spent some time in in Britain in Roman Britain, uh, was a brilliant thinker, especially for his day. <clears throat> uh, it, it was a passage from Romans that that uh, that someone, that a, a child came to him in a dream and said, read this verse. And it was from Romans, and it was uh, <clears throat> instrumental in his, uh, in his conversion. Pardon me for just... Um, John Wesley, who we talked, who we uh, talked about last week, uh, John Wesley, who had already been ordained for ten years, when he uh, was reflecting on Romans and listening to a group of German Christians called Moravi Moravians uh, sing, and he considered that moment to be his conversion to Christianity. He'd been he'd been a priest for ten years already. Uh, that might be getting the cart before the horse or after the horse. I'm not exactly sure. Um, <clears throat> Martin Luther, I got these out of order, but Martin Luther developed his entire theology of justification by faith alone because of his reading of Romans. And then someone who I think we don't read enough, um, and that is uh, Karl Barth. And part of it is that he's hard to read. Um, but uh, even in small pieces, I think there's so much about uh, what Karl Barth has written <clears throat> that is valuable. Uh, he looked, uh, his commentary on Romans gave him the foundation uh, to lead a resistance movement against the Nazis. So Romans has had this outsized impact on the church and its, uh, and its engagement with culture over the last 2,000 years. And there's nothing wrong with taking Luther and Bart's word for it, but let me just read like I did last week. <clears throat> One simple verse from Romans 5, 8, where Paul writes, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There is so much in that one sentence that uh, that explains the heart of the gospel for us, that God loves us, that God's willing to demonstrate that love for us so that we can experience it. <clears throat> God loves us even though we don't deserve it, and that God was willing to become human and to die in order to prove his love for us. There, There's so much, that's just one from one verse. Now, thank goodness the whole book isn't as dense as that, or we'd never get through it. Uh, we made it all the way through most of verse one last week, uh, we're going to try and to step up the pace just a bit. <clears throat> Bart would remind us that everything we need to know about God is contained in the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus. 
that we learn <clears throat> everything that we need to know about God in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, he said, Jesus was humble. God must be humble. Jesus was creative. God must be creative. Jesus was somebody who brought people together in community. God must be somebody who brings people together in community. <clears throat> Everything we need to know about God, we learn in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the entire point of the letter of Romans. <clears throat> Last week, we read most of verse 1 and started talking about Paul the Apostle. We talked about his upbringing and background, that he was a... He was sure to have been identified from an early age as a very bright student, <clears throat> that he came from a middle-class family that had Roman citizenship, uh, that he was very well educated and also learned a trade. Um, when I was in high school, my parents were adamant that I work my way through college with a trade just to have something to fall back on in case college didn't work out. Some of you are from a generation where that was the mindset. That was clearly my parents' mindset. So for 11 years, I worked for an electrician while I got my English literature degree and went to seminary. <clears throat> so Paul was uh, Paul had a trade. He made tents, which is not – he wasn't making camping gear. He was making the kinds of things that people would use to – <clears throat> uh, to build a market stall or even for soldiers to take out into the field to shield themselves from the sun. Um, <clears throat> then, as now, there are Bedouin communities meandering around Israel, Palestine, and uh, Paul and, and Syria. Paul would have been making tents for people like that to take out with them <clears throat> and to tend their goats uh, and to shield themselves from, from the heat of the sun. Um, <clears throat> just an important thing. I'll probably say this every week because it's it, it may not resonate, but it's very important to the story. Paul's a product. <clears throat> <clears throat> Paul is a product of three distinct worlds. He is a product of the Jewish world and all that that means, and we're going to spend some time in that tonight. He's a product of the Greek-speaking world, that, that Hellenization that I talk about every Pentecost, that, that Alexander the Great conquered the Western world and imposed one language so that everybody could do business with each other. Paul is a product of that culture and of that world. And he's a Roman citizen, at least second generation. So uh, he's a product in some ways of uh, learning how to function within an empire that's occupying your country, but allowing you to live and thrive and make a living. And so um, <clears throat> there aren't a lot of people that <clears throat> fit that profile. Paul was, I, I can't say he's unique because he's probably not the only one person that had that profile in history, but it was certainly a rare profile and uh, a perfect one for God to reach into his life and to um, to make him uh, an apostle, somebody who was who was there to take the faith to the non-Jewish world. We are here tonight in part because of the movement that Paul started. Up until Paul, for the most part, the Christian faith was a Jewish um, sect. It was a a denomination of Judaism that happened to believe that Jesus was the Messiah they'd been waiting for. <clears throat> Once Paul comes on the scene, uh, it's 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 like uh, it, it's like in the early days that the the gospel was in limited release, but when Paul comes, it goes worldwide. Uh, <clears throat> it's Paul that leads the way to the expansion that Jesus talks about in the Great Commission, you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's Paul is the one who actually implements that church, that spread of the faith and growth in the church. <clears throat> Those Greek and Roman backgrounds helped Paul in his ministry, gave him a language that he could preach in, that everybody understood in addition to their own local languages, 
and being a Roman citizen allowed him free travel within uh, areas that uh, that r the Roman military controlled. And so, if you if you've uh, had your Bible in your hands anytime recently, and you remember that in the back they almost all come with maps, the maps at the end are almost all Paul's missionary journeys. So Paul got around, and when I say got around, I mean he got around on foot and by donkey and by ship. Uh, it, when you when you hold up a map to the and you pay attention to the the miles, uh, the the legend down at the bottom that tells you how far he went, Paul got around for somebody who didn't have um, a car or a ship or a plane to travel on. So um, <clears throat> last week, we just focused on verse one. I'm going to read you now verses one through four. Um, listen, uh, listen for these words uh, that Paul wrote to the Romans. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. And then colon, this is who he's been talking about, Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> Paul's uh, Jewish upbringing uh, and his study helped him see Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, it is the fact that Paul was so steeped in Jewish culture and Jewish traditions and Jewish prophecies <clears throat> that that it allowed him, even though it took a miracle, right? Even though God had to come and, and visit him in a vision, <laughs> there's, you know, all of us have to get knocked in the head at some point to, to learn something that we need to learn. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Um. <clears throat> But Paul's upbringing and his study and his, his utter command of the Jewish scriptures, both the written ones and the oral tradition that went alongside them, helped him to understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of those prophecies. I want to say a little bit about the scriptures that Paul knew. On the one hand, <clears throat> Paul knew the, what we would call the Old Testament. That's clear. Uh, <clears throat> he would have known the Old Testament in two different languages. He would have known it in Hebrew as a trained rabbi, but he also would have known the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament, in Greek, because the, the dominant scripture, even for Jews in the first century, was a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, this doesn't matter. It's called the Septuagint. Um, if you look in your Bible, you may see in the footnote every so often uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the Septuagint reads this passage this way. Sometimes there's a passage about the Lion of Judah in the Old Testament, and in the Septuagint, it may be the tiger, or it may be the bear. It, it, so the, and sometimes there are little variations in the translations, but Paul would have been steeped in the Hebrew Bible in two different languages. There was also, alongside the written scriptures, an oral tradition that explained the stories of the Old Testament. It's another 200 years later, that would be put into writing. And for those of you who know this stuff, that's called the Mishnah. It's it's a it's a it's like a commentary, a running commentary on the Hebrew scriptures. Paul would have had that oral tradition and the written tradition memorized. Memorized. From Genesis to Malachi, plus the commentary alongside it. Paul would have had it committed to memory and would have recited it uh, during the day to preserve it in his memory. There's a legendary New Testament scholar in the middle part of the 20th century who had a very bright student. He knew that this student was going to be a great scholar when he finished. And so for his PhD program, he made him uh, 
take the same education as the Apostle Paul. Memorized the Greek and Hebrew Old Testaments and the Mishnah, the commentary. And from that, he was able to write uh, commentaries on Paul, which many had to learn Greek too. Uh, well, he would have known it for the Septuagint, but he, he had to write on the New Testament having memorized the Old Testament. Just unbelievable stuff. Paul's Jewish upbringing helped him see Jesus as the Messiah. Paul, and we don't often talk about this, Paul was a very devout man. All of the indicators are that Paul would have been in a tradition where there were multiple times of prayer during the day. And uh, I mean, we learn a little bit from Paul's writing. We know that Paul didn't do anything halfway. And so Paul would have, in the midst of his study and reciting of the scriptures and his reflection on God and his tent making would have also been somebody who spent a lot of time in prayer. And the prayers that Paul offered were the traditional prayers of a first century Jew. And a lot of them pointed directly toward hoping for the Messiah. So here's a guy who was brilliant, who had all the scriptures committed to uh, committed to memory in two different languages, who prayed prayers of hope for the Messiah. That's the guy that Jesus encounters in the vision on the Damascus Road. You know that story. Paul is st Paul's on his way to persecute more Christians, and a vision comes to him, and it's it's Jesus saying, "Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me?" And Paul becomes blind. He's blind for three days. Some Christians don't trust him, but they nurse him back to health. And then he becomes the Paul that we know. That Paul had been praying for that moment his entire life. He just had no idea how it was going to happen. <clears throat> Paul knew the stories of the Torah and the prophets, and he knew the promises for God, of God for a Redeemer or a Messiah. Here's another detail, though. Paul understood the Jewish story as a series of stories of disobedient and a, a, a disobedience and punishment, disobedience and abandonment by God. Uh, in the garden, even even in the Genesis story, which if you were in our Bible class last year, you know the the Genesis story was edited together after the exile, because all of a sudden being banished from the garden made sense to them as a warning story not to do that again. But even the in the garden, Adam and Eve disobey God, and they're kicked out of the garden. They are exiled from the garden. Uh, in Judah, uh, the people disobeyed in the 6th or 7th century BC, and they were uh, taken into uh, exile in Babylon. And that story becomes... The uh, the like one of the controlling stories of Jewish thought and practice and prayer was the exile. Uh, in in Paul's own time, the promised land was occupied by a redeem by a by foreigners, and what they needed and what they had been praying for for centuries was a rescuer, uh, a redeemer, uh, a messiah. There are literally hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament uh, about the Messiah coming. And these are the things that Paul is uh, is talking about in verses 2 and 3, uh, where he says, I was aware of all these promises. Um, uh, one source that I looked at today said there were more than 300. I started looking them up. Some of them are a little bit on the uh, thin side. But listen to these. And some of these you'll know because we read them every year in Advent. But from Isaiah 9, <clears throat> For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness 
from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Notice that ties directly into what Paul says in the verses we read tonight. He says, I am the apostle of Jesus, descendant of David. He's connecting the Messiah to David because that's what was promised in the prophecies. In Micah, two, uh, in Daniel 9, uh, verse 26, it says, The anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who come will, will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's a double prophecy for the death of the Messiah and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which happened about 40 years after Jesus was killed. And then Micah 5.2 says, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So these are three big ones that all talk about the coming of the Messiah or a particular detail about the Messiah's life. These are the things and hundreds more that Paul would have had committed to memory that Paul would have really uh, guided his life and, and his own ministry on the hopes that were communicated in those passages. Um, Paul was ready. I think we, you know, we, we spend so much time on Paul um, uh, during his ministry. We, we don't often think about him before that Damascus Road experience, but Paul was ready both emotionally and scripturally, to understand who Jesus was. He had the temperament, because whatever else we say about Paul being an aggressive, argumentative, cranky guy, Paul was a guy who spent hours of his busy days in prayer. He had a tender heart toward God. He was ready emotionally. To, to understand who Jesus was, and he was definitely ready scripturally in two different languages to understand who Jesus was. And so, listen again to the four passages that I read, and then we'll, we'll go to some conversation. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. The first four verses of the first chapter of Romans lay out who Paul is, and also what he's doing. He's an apostle of the gospel. He, it lays out that this is, this is the Messiah that all of us have been waiting for uh, all of these many years. And it is through his resurrection that he proves that he is who he says he is. That's four verses. That's four verses. At the very start, Paul's not even in the meat of the letter yet. Uh, let me let me open. I know that that's a little shorter than we normally go, but I, I think Romans is so dense. It's it's good for us to have some conversation. Let me uh, unmute us. And if you've got your Bibles open and you've got a particular question about part of this text uh, or something else, let's let's dive into it. Dale. Yeah. Is there any indication, or or is it just logical to assume that? He was so fervent in his persecution because he was, in a sense, so ready for so wanting there to be a Messiah. And he thought this was sacrilege for somebody to be pretending to be. Yeah. Yeah. The one of the sources that I'm using for this, <clears throat> uh, uh, a guy named N.T. Wright, uh, in his biography of Paul, he talks about this particular part of Paul's life uh, and his ministry as a as a Pharisee. 
saying that he was so fervently against the early Christians because he thought they were going to prevent the Messiah from coming. That somehow their lack of pure Jewish faith was going to present uh, prevent uh, the Messiah from coming. And so uh, his, his zeal for persecution was actually a zeal to cleanse and purify the Jewish movement so that uh, so that people so that the Messiah would come. Yeah, Bert, please. I can't escape the the thought that going back to the origin that God created us, and yet we are alienated from God because we don't live the way God intended, mm-hmm. and that therefore the creation must be flawed. Huh. Uh, that's a great. That's a great question or or idea. I think the the creation stories tell us something about this. Uh, and I say stories because you, if you've read the first few chapters of Genesis, there's two creation stories. Uh, they come from different sources, but they're they're trying to tell part of the same story. And the one thing that uh, the one thing that Genesis is clear on in the beginning, literally in the beginning, is that creation's good at the start. That creation gets broken, not that it was flawed from the start. Because there's this, uh, um, uh, th- th- this will make me choke up because my preaching professor had such an amazing sermon on this text. And, and he had this cadence about how uh, God created all these things. And, and one of the creation accounts, you get what he did on the first day and the second day and the third day and the fourth day. And it was good. And it was good. And it was good. And it was very good. And so I, if, if the text is, our, is part, of the, uh, part of the data that we're looking at to see what creation was like from the beginning, the text tells us, that it was good at the beginning and that it got broken. And, uh, you know, it's it's more for the philosophers than for the historians uh, to talk about um, how, how sin has that impact. Uh, Augustine, the, one of the people that I mentioned in the beginning of our, our time tonight, Augustine is the one who first started formulating a uh a, a real theology of original sin but that doesn't really happen until the fourth century and okay. uh and a lot of the church has been over the years damaged by augustine's view of original sin um it's one thing to say that we all enter into a life that has sin in it. It's another thing to say that we're doomed from the moment of birth because we've inherited a punishment because of what Adam and Eve did. And uh, that may have made sense in the fourth century, and it may have made sense to Calvin, who used Augustine to write his theology, and that's the foundational theology of the Presbyterian Church, so I tread a little bit lightly here, although as I look around, I don't see a lot of pure Calvinists on my screen. Um, It's, uh, but I I don't, uh, I think Augustine got that wrong, but Augustine got so much other stuff right that, uh, um, you know, we, we have to, we have to fix the theologies of generations that came before us. Um, and, and I think a lot of that fixing is happening now. Over the last 30 or 40 years, there's been a lot of rethinking of just what does original sin mean and what does uh, and what it doesn't mean. But original sin is connected to your question, Bert, because that's uh, if it was doomed from the beginning to do that, then then all of this is God's fault. Can't escape that logic. Uh, 
if it's if it's flawed and heading towards sin from the start, then it's God's fault. The whole mess is God's fault, and he should fix it. Well, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. now, I understand that the other Catholic Church, the Orthodox, doesn't abide by the doctrine of original sin. Sometimes I say, more power to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, they'll... they'll um, nothing happens in a vacuum. Right. I mean, these big movements and like the Reformation, we think about the Reformation like it was inevitable that it happened the way that it did. When when you drill down so much of the Reformation and any other big event in history is tied to the people who are uh, leading it and experiencing it at the time. So. For example, and now I'm, we're way we're way in a tangent now. Fair warning. I'm listening to a podcast. Uh, I'm on the fifth of seven uh, episodes on the run up to the First World War. And it's shocking to me how many at how many points that whole war could have been averted. I mean, like clear thing where literally the wrong person was at the negotiating table at the wrong moment for something good to happen. Uh, it was shocking to me that the Russian ambassador had a German name and the German ambassador had a Russian name and they were meant to be negotiating together. Uh, one guy clearly wanted war and did everything he could to goose it along uh, while all the other diplomats were trying to prevent it. So anyway, that I hope that that connection makes sense. These stories and these theologies, they come out of real people who are living real lives. And um, and a lot of the times what they write is impacted as much by their experiences last month or a year before they wrote uh, as much as in the big sense uh, of, of, of being a, a movement that was planned to be what it ended up being. That, that's important for the idea of original sin. That's important for ideas like predestination. That's important for some of the things that have torn churches apart uh, in our own denomination for the last 50 years. Somebody writes a thing, somebody says, okay, and they get on with the rest of their life without ever critically examining that thing that they've accepted then and that becomes um, sort of etched in stone until it's not, right? Until somebody breaks the stone. Um, women who cut their hair and wore earrings were considered prostitutes in the first century. Uh, how's that going to play if I preach that text on a Sunday morning? Uh, we, part of this class, part of our Bible study, when, whenever we can find our, our weeks and, and we do these Thursday night Bible studies, all of this is so we can try and understand this stuff better and soften out some of the mistakes we've inherited, uh, partly so we can do it better and partly so we can make our own mistakes. I'd rather make my own mistakes than just repeat the ones that I inherited. Uh, so anyway, what else about Romans or Rome or anything else? Jack, please. Oh, I think you're muted, Jack. Jack, I think you're muted. Okay, now, now can you hear me? Yeah. No, you can hear me. Okay, because uh, we were watching uh, CBS Sunday morning, and they uh, mentioned uh, <clears throat> Malcolm Gladwell, and he mentioned this book, Tipping Point, and I hadn't read it, so I got the book, yeah. and I started reading it. And it goes right along with what you're saying, uh, because, you know, uh, I mean, with respect to Paul, he's the, 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 the typical guy, but he doesn't mention Paul, at least at the, the I haven't finished the book yet. <laughs> But he mentions like Paul Revere. Uh, he 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 uh, 
he rides and he says, uh, the British are coming, the British are coming, and everybody pays attention to it. But he said, there's another guy by the name of Dawes, I don't know his first name, and he did the same thing, but they didn't pay attention to him yeah. because he wasn't a persuader like right. Paul. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. But what you're saying is you got uh, people like uh, Aquinas and, and so forth, and and they and they have the persuasive quality, and and we're seeing it in in politics right now. Sure. I mean, this guy Waltz, for example. I mean, he he obviously. I don't want to get into too much politics, and Judy's going to hate me for this. Yeah, correct. But I mean, <laughs> but but he debated somebody who was a lot smoother. Okay, but he came across as authentic, yeah. and people are listening to him. You know, it's just the same thing. It's just. <clears throat> Thanks. Tim, did you have? Yeah, and just a real quick question for you, John. In your opinion, um, with all of Paul's attributes, education, background, working, citizenship, um, <laughs> and then he's uh, he suddenly has this conversion, but where did he get, I mean, was it in the conversion or is it in his experience as a persecutor of Christians that he suddenly becomes uh knowledgeable of the gospel or knowledgeable about yeah. jesus christ in your yeah. opinion where did that transfer and that knowledge come from yeah yeah Stephen. that's a great question i i think it, the first thing and i'm guilty of this i'm guessing most of us are guilty about this most of us who preach and teach are guilty of this what i'm about to say we forget that our christian faith is an extension of judaism and that it makes absolutely no sense without its Jewish background. We've been teaching a truncated gospel where Jesus plops out of the sky on Christmas Eve, and uh, and he has this life, and it's amazing, and we believe it's amazing, and we pray to mm -hmm. him, and we, we lament every Lent that we know what's going to happen during Holy Week, and uh, and we celebrate on Easter, but all of that is like a third of the story if it isn't also connected to its Jewish background. Mm -hmm. And and reading Paul reminds us of that. Um, Paul had that background, and so he was able to uh, interpret Jesus not just as, wow, here's this amazing guy. It's, I've got 800 years of Jewish history behind me and writings, and it all comes together in this person. So part of the gospel, Paul knew better than anybody, even before he understood it, even before he encountered Jesus, he knew what was coming. He knew what to look for. Uh, the, the other thing is, is that after Paul's conversion, he goes and sits under the teaching of people who actually knew Jesus. Paul doesn't start out as CEO, uh, but he also doesn't start out as a private. You're right. Paul Paul comes in like like West Point grads as a second lieutenant. He's there. They know he's an officer, uh, but he's not a general yet, <laughs> and so. Paul, I don't, I can't remember how many years Paul sits under the teaching of people who actually knew who Jesus was. And then when Paul has understood uh, what he needs to understand from them about the person of Jesus, he combines that with what he already knew about the prophecies of, and teachings about the Messiah to come. And then it's Paul who is the first one to have a fully formed understanding of who Jesus is. Not even the disciples had that. Remember, the disciples are screwing up right up until the end. Uh, they stopped disappointing Jesus at the ascension because Jesus wasn't there anymore to disappoint. And so uh, Paul is the one who comes with his uh, Jewish background, his extensive understanding of that, his cultural knowledge, his his uh, education, his natural intelligence, and also his experience of Jesus on the Damascus Road, followed up by his uh, absorbing 
uh, things from people who actually heard Jesus give the Sermon on the Mount and the say the Beatitudes and teach the parables and um, wash their feet. Paul's soaking up the the last missing piece of what he understood about the gospel, which was the firsthand stuff, which he never got to have. And so it seems like it happens quickly on the page, but I think there's a, a multi-year gap between Paul's conversion and the beginning of his uh, his apostolic ministry. Okay. I'll try and figure that out for next time. But <laughs> that, that's probably that's probably an answer that had a way longer background than you wanted. But that's that's what it is. Good. That's good. Um, what else, Ted? Please. Yeah, so, so I really struggle. <clears throat> if Paul was such a devout Jew and knew the Bible inside and out, what about the seventh commandment? Well, even uh, so, th I'm presuming not knowing them by heart. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Yeah, which uh, all always sat alongside uh, Jewish teaching, Jewish judicial teaching that 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 had a, a a death penalty that had capital punishment. And so, I don't think I think like most people, thou shalt not kill is really thou shalt not murder. And uh, uh, it might not make as much difference to the person that it happens to, but there's a difference between killing and murder. So I think Paul was part, mm -hmm. Paul saw those executions as uh, justice, as religious justice. Um, did you say that some Christians nursed uh, Paul back to health though when he was blind? Yeah. Yeah, is that kind of like a John Valjean experience? Uh, <laughs> well, it's probably stole their silverware. But... <clears throat> well, they didn't trust him, and the person yeah. whose house, if I remember this right, the person whose house they brought him to didn't want anything to do with him, and for for reasons that you know we we read these stories and we forget about the humanity of these stories, but everybody's favorite person in the early church was Stephen. Stephen, the way he comes across in the very few chapters where he makes his appearance, Stephen was uh, beloved and trusted. When there was an argument in the church in Jerusalem between the Jewish widows and the Gentile widows about the way food was distributed it was Stephen who put together a team of people, and the names are listed so that you can tell that there's some Greeks and some Jews in, in the group that he put. Peter was loved and respected, and Paul presided at his execution. And so, you know, a lot of those people did not want anything to do with Paul after his conversion. Um, if you're if you're wondering where that story is, I'm pretty sure that's Acts seven, um, and uh, it's at the very end of Stephen's life, where it's it's almost like the camera turns this way, and it's Paul who's watching all their clothes while they stone Stephen to death. Um, <laughs> I, th I think that's probably a very important thing for us to talk about next week is Paul's reception into uh, the Christian uh, the Christian movement. I think that'll it'll just round out our sense of Paul uh, as we move in uh, farther into the letter. We are going to pick up speed eventually, but not yet. This stuff's too good. It's too important to know who Paul is before we know what Paul wrote. Um, and so does that help, Ted? Does that, I forget whose question I was answering now. Dale's. Oh, it was Dale's. That's right. Dale, did that answer your question? <clears throat> it's okay to say no. Yeah. Your question. Okay. <laughs> it's all right if it didn't. <laughs> um, I think, uh, uh, 
I think what Paul, and you hear him do this in a couple of letters, Paul uh, makes the case for himself where he says, hey, I'm not just some schmo off the street. I did. Th I was a Jew of Jews. I was a Pharisee. Uh, he, he's always giving a little bit of his resume uh, in his letters. And some of that is because uh, uh, there are still people who don't trust him and don't like him because of what he did to Stephen and others. Stephen's the only one we know by name. Paul was on his way to do it again on the Damascus Road. And so, um, you know, I, I, I have people that I love who have been taken too soon. And uh, if that had been done by somebody, I don't think five years later I'd want to go to church with that person. Ten years later, 20 years later, maybe never. Um. So uh, it's real people with real lives and real stories and real wounds who, who just like us, who form this first group that we call the church. And Paul's writing in this letter to a church that has all the regular problems of being a church, trying to figure out who Jesus was, trying to agree on how you're going to run things trying to, you know, trying to agree on the music they sing, right? They're all arguing about the same stuff 2,000 years ago. And in Rome, they are literally right next to the source of power that will be the source of persecution against Christians for the next, off and on for the next three centuries. So Paul's writing to them, because he knows they are in a precarious place and also at a hugely influential place. The church in Rome uh, had potential to be and ended up being an incredibly influential Christian community. Christians were a mystery to Romans. Romans this is all shorthand, okay? After I just said everybody's a real person and fully rounded. Here, now I'm going to go back to some stereotypes. Ro Romans were transactional. Everything had a price. And if you, didn't, if you didn't provide some value to the conversation or to the situation, you were marginalized. Into that comes a group that shares its stuff, takes care of the poor, even if they weren't Christians, and who drives everybody nuts with their kindness. There's a, a second or third century emperor who says, I can't stand these Christians. They're making us look bad. No political power, no property to speak of, no wealth, no army. And the Roman emperor is being shamed by this Christian community that is loving its neighbors so well, they're making the Romans look bad. That's the Roman church a couple of centuries after this letter that Paul wrote. How's that? <laughs> that might do us for tonight. Anybody got a last question or comment? Or Yeah, Tad, please. So... I'm reading a, a book about the glory days of Baghdad and Islam. And, and, you know, the tents, even when they had palaces, some of the caliphs held receptions in their tents. Mm. And, and Taurus would have been part of that, you know, so yeah. the tents might not be what we think of. And the other thing is, you know, because I always question when you tell me something, uh, in 700, Greek is still an important language in Baghdad for the oh, educated yeah. and the scientific. It's not the day-to-day -day language, but the yeah. educated, the elite, and the scientific uh, is still using Greek. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even think uh, – anybody remember the years of Jerome? Jerome is – he's in a fight with somebody. I just can't place the century. But there's not even a Latin Bible until Jerome, which is centuries after all of this. Everything was still in Greek. Uh, 
both at that point, both the Old Testament and the New Testament for most people. Was Rabbi, the Vulgate? I'm sorry. Was the, Vul, was the Vulgate translated from Greek or from Hebrew? Uh, the Vulgate yeah. was translated from uh, Greek. From the um, the Septuagint. Old Testament of it was translated oh, okay. from the Septuagint. But uh, I'm going to double check on that. Wrong in both languages. Huh? Wrong in that? both languages. Say it one more time. Rome, Harry says Rome knew, knew both languages. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And Latin was spoken, think of Latin as Italian. That's what it would have sounded like. Uh, and so they had that language as the local language, but the language of commerce and business and government uh, for centuries after Christ was still Greek. Was still Greek. Um. I, I'm gonna. I, I misspoke. I think. I think uh, Jerome had Hebrew texts for the Old Testament, and um, uh, but I'm gonna check on that too. I'll have Jack check on you. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, this was fun. Uh, this is. Uh, this doesn't always play to my strengths until we get to the historical context stuff, but, uh, but I've never spent this much time in the first few verses of Romans <laughs> ever. <laughs> and so uh, we'll see if we can make it uh, to, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can make it through another section uh, next week. And then just a reminder, we're off on uh, the 24th of October the next week is Halloween, and I don't know about you, but there'll be all kinds of littles uh, crawling up my street, and I'm not likely to be teaching. I'm teaching literally right out my front window. I wonder if my neighbors are getting a free Bible study out there, uh, <laughs> but we can decide next week uh, if uh, if Halloween is sometime when you're, you, you know, if you've got people knocking on your door during the whole class, that's not going to work. So, uh, so we'll see about next week. I mean, about the 31st, but uh, definitely on next week, definitely on the week after that, and then uh, possibly off for two weeks in a row, but definitely on October 24th, I'll be in Philadelphia. So let me close us in prayer. Um, God, thank you for, um, thank you for Paul for the, the life that he lived and for the things that he wrote and for the gospel that he preached and tried to communicate to so many people. Uh, we're thankful as the recipients of his ministry and, and that blessing to us. Uh, maybe the lesson for us is that we've got a role to play in sharing that same gospel. And so uh, as we continue this journey, shape us into people who who communicate and reflect that story of Jesus in a meaningful way. Pray this in your son's name. Amen.